welcome to the Midlife Leap, a lifestyle talk show for women in midlife, sharing tips and interviews on topics ranging from business, career, current news, fashion, shopping, health, travel, and so much more. Please subscribe to this channel so you'll receive alerts of new episodes. And like this video so that other midlife women just like you will be alerted by YouTube to check out the Midlife Leap Show. Do you wonder if you're aging too fast? Because although you're in midlife, your body feels like a 70 year old. Well, smoking, eating junk food, stress, and lack of exercise are huge factors that cause our body to age quickly. Now, if you want to know if your body is truly aging quickly, there are commercial tests for that. You know, science is always catching up to things. And these tests will measure the length of your telomeres. What are telomeres? Telomeres are protective caps on the end of chromosomes and telomeres become shorter from unhealthy habits, which prevents them from protecting the chromosomes and the cells will die as a result. Science. Now, this leads to chronic disease and lower life expectancy and most likely why you feel like you're in your 70s, although you're 35, 40, 50. Now, whether you decide to take a test or not, many of us need to live healthier lives. And you can start by eating healthier, maintaining a healthy weight, get some exercise, reduce stress, and stop smoking. Now, maybe it's not too late to start feeling your age. My guest is a retired FBI special agent turned crime author. After attending law school, Dana Reidenauer entered duty as a special agent with the FBI, where she worked a wide variety of cases such as narcotics investigations, domestic self-trafficking of minors, and violent crime. She was also a member of the FBI's evidence response team where she and her team traveled to New York City in response to the 9-11 World Trade Center attack. Dana's first novel, Behind the Mask, is crime fiction based on her personal experiences working as an undercover agent for 21 years in the FBI field. Dana's second novel, is an award-winning novel titled Beyond the Cabin, and Below the Radar is her third novel, and she has written two television series screenplays and is currently working on her fourth novel. Mind you, her entire novel series is based on her FBI experience. Welcome, Dana. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I've looked forward to this podcast so much. So I'm excited because I want to know what inspired you to become a crime author and use your experiences in the FBI when most people were probably just like, okay, I'm retired now. I'm taking a break from all of this crime. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, I always laugh and tell people my first book was therapy. I had come out of working um, several years undercover straight in a row, almost seven years, actually. So I think I had a lot of pent up uh, aggression. <laughs> I started writing the first book and it was actually therapy. It was flowing out um, onto the page, but I was originally writing it for my mom because I spent all these years undercover and my mother never knew what I did. She knew I was an FBI agent, obviously, and she knew I was undercover, but she had no idea what kind of cases I was working. So my first um, idea was just to write a book for my mom. And I didn't think long term, I wasn't thinking a career as a, a novelist, but I had such a good time doing it. And then, then the second book just started rolling out and before long, the third book. And um, I guess it's uh, it was meant to be. <laughs> but I, I also wanted to write the books about the FBI because there's there's so many things out there about the FBI, but there's so many things that are wrong. I mean, no, I mean, if you watch anything on television and the movies, and that's not the FBI. You know, that is just uh, purely fiction for the most part. So I wanted to write books that really showed the true FBI. 
as much as I could without being boring, I guess. But uh, I wanted I wanted to show the psychological toll that working undercover has on an undercover agent for one thing too. But but that was the goal with the books. Got it. So, and actually, if you'll give a brief brief synopsis of your books, I can put the photo up if you don't have a book with you for each one. And mm -hmm. please share if Lexi Montgomery Montgomery is based on who you are. And then you mentioned the true FBI. I'm guessing that's the um, the, the disloyalty <laughs> that I'm sure you share <laughs> in your synopsis as well. <laughs> well, and um, in the first book, Lexi Montgomery is a brand new undercover agent. The books came directly out of my journals. I kept journals the whole time I was working undercover. I kept them hidden in the ceiling panel of my undercover apartment where nobody could find them. So a lot of people say, well, is Lexi you? And since they came right out of my journal, okay, so behind the mask is the first in the series. And it's also Lexi Montgomery's very first undercover mission. And she is based on me because she did come right out of my journals. I, I, I kept the journals while I was working undercover. Um, I kept them hidden in the ceiling panel of my apartment because obviously you couldn't let targets find something like that. So I had these journals that I kept throughout the years I was working undercover. And when I started writing the first book, I started looking at the journals and it was mostly the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions that I was having personally as an undercover agent. Because everybody thinks it's so romantic. They see it on television and the movies, but it's really actually a very lonely thing. Working undercover, you're by yourself for the most time, most of the time. You don't have any access to your family or your friends. They can't call you. You can't text them. So it's a real different world you're living in when you're working full time undercover, and which is what I was doing. So the first book behind the mask is Lexi Montgomery's very first case. So she's a little naive and a little green and um, she's kind of working out the, uh, the whole learning the undercover, learning the ropes of working undercover. And she gets thrown into with a group of uh, animal rights extremists. And of course, they're all nice people. I mean, she likes them because most of the activists, everybody kind of thinks that I don't like activists, you know, it, which is the opposite. I love activists. I think activists are, are wonderful people. It's the people that were going beyond activism that the FBI was looking at, the people doing the arsons and things like that. It was um, causing property damage, excessive property damage and, and putting lives in danger with uh, incendiary devices, things like that. But the above ground activists, I have no problems with. But so Alexei, of course, is is targeting a group of people and she's um, she's looking for the weakest link. And she finds a young undercover. I mean, a young girl from South Carolina who's in California. It's like bright lights, big city, the whole thing. So she targets this young girl from South Carolina thinking um, she would be the weakest link to get in. And, and that's how she worked her way into the group. So that's the first book. The first book is set in California, which is where I did all my undercover work when I was working those kind of cases. So the first book is set in California. The, the, the second book is set in South Carolina. I live in the low country of South Carolina, and I, I love the low country. It's kind of my heart and soul. So when I was writing the second book, the beauty of having an undercover agent is you can move her around. Because you never work in your backyard as an FBI undercover agent. You're always working someplace where you don't actually live. So Lexi's picked up and she's moved to the low country of South Carolina for the second book. And <clears throat> she's brought in to work a case here. And I wanted the low country to almost be a character. I wanted people to feel it, to feel the humidity on their skin and, and uh, walk away with just a kind of a little bit of the taste of what it's like to live here. So that was my goal with the second book. Now, a lot of people don't realize that um, later in my career, I had a partner. It was a male partner and it happened to be my boyfriend. We were romantically involved. So we were dating and um, I was asked to go do another full time undercover. It called for two undercover agents. So um, I went back and asked my boyfriend, hey, how do you feel about working at and playing a couple in an undercover a role that could go on for years. And it did. <laughs> it went on about three years. So we were a romantically involved couple playing a couple uh, for three years. And we worked this case together. So, of course, one day Bill came home and said, well, how come I never made the book? And, of course, I have to tell you, he's my husband now. So it all went well. <laughs> 
after working uh, the undercover so long, we figured, uh, hey, marriage is a cakewalk, right? So we are married. So he was kind of teasing me about uh, the books and not being in the books. So I said, well, honey, guess what? The third book, Lexi has a male partner. <laughs> so, so that's where the third book came from. And it is based on a case that he and I worked together where we traveled overseas, where we attended a terrorist training camp together and uh, with some American targets. So that's where the third book comes from. So the premises of the books are all kind of based on real characters and real cases, but they are all fictionalized because it's uh, just a lot easier. Um, the Bureau has to review all my books before I'm allowed to publish. So uh, yeah. I have to be careful what I put in them and don't give away trade secrets. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I'm glad you mentioned that you guys got married because my question was, well, what happens if you break up? And then you still have to pretend to be a in a relationship. Sometimes people hate each other. <laughs> you still have to deal with this person because I'm sure you can't ruin the case or you no pretend. <laughs> well, that was a big um, that was a big problem that some of the people in the FBI had. Actually, it was a worry. And half of the people thought, oh, this is going to be a great idea. But there were a few that said, no, this is a stupid idea. This is crazy because you guys are going to kill each other. You know, a romantically involved couple working 24-7. You're working together, living together, spending every single minute together. This is just not a good idea. But we talked them into letting us do it. And the plan was if something happened to our relationship, that I would continue on in the case and then poor Bill would just get transferred wherever. So he was actually taking a bigger risk than I was because he could have wow. been transferred anywhere. But it was it was a worry. I mean, and, and honestly, we didn't know how we would do. I mean, we knew we got along really well, but those are completely different conditions when you're under that kind of stress and pressure every single day. Yeah. So you can't give away any trade secrets in your, in your book, but you are mentioning that I, I don't remember which book it was that you're be, that well Lexi is betrayed by mm -hmm. possibly one of her own but she can't figure out who that as a adds another dynamic one she's working on these cases but then she also has to kind of investigate her own people right right and that's always you know I mean in any organization you run the risk of um people going south and going to the wrong side, that sort of thing. And, you know, the Bureau doesn't have a lot of that, but it does happen. And um, I know there's been situations where, especially in huge cases like with espionage or spy things, that they've run cases right out of the same office that the person's working for, working in, and the person never found out that they were a target of the investigation until they were arrested, which I don't know how they can pull off something like that, but they have. <laughs> so. Wow. So tell us a little bit more about the first book, because, of course, our, our watchers, if they're going to start reading your books, they'll most likely start with the first book in the series just to get to know Lexi. I'm sure it lays the groundwork for her. Feel free to read an excerpt of the book if you want to uh, just well, share a bit more. Um, the first, I, I like the first book. Uh, I was really surprised. It was it won so many awards, and it was my first novel. So I was really surprised when it did as well as it did, and um, it had a great Kirkus review, and it was picked as one of the best indie books of 2016 by Kirkus Review. So that that meant so much to me that the reviewers liked it. So, um, but it. it it's it's the it's Lexi's story basically from the start. You know, the brand new agent, and it also shows you know the the effects of working the undercover. You know, she gets close to people, she becomes friends with people, but the object of undercover work is you're building these relationships, knowing that you're going to betray the relationships. I mean, there's no way you're not going to betray the relationships. That's that's what you're doing. You're in there, and Lexi struggles with that. I mean, she struggles with it's not black and white. Everything's gray when you're working undercover work. So in the, that's in the first novel. She's young and she's trying to figure out who she is. And she's also kind of walking this line of, you know, um, am I doing the right thing? Because she's seeing the good work that a lot of these, these activists are doing. And she's starting to kind of fall into that and slip down that slope a little bit because 
you know, she's the same age as these people. She um, loves animals and she's starting to feel that maybe she's on the wrong side. What if, what if they're doing the right thing and she's doing the wrong thing? And, and it's, it's something that she had to struggle with. So that's the whole book is kind of her and, and setting up this investigation, trying to not get burned <laughs> and also building these relationships. And then the, the young girl from South Carolina, the Savannah character, um, that's the person that she had targeted to flip. And then that's always very risky. You've got, you're, you're pulling in that person and you're going to reveal who you are because you're going to try to flip them and use them. And that is a really risky thing because if they don't get on board that ship with you, um, your case is gone. I mean, it's solved because she's going to go back and tell everybody. So it's uh, it's it's a risk. And that's one of the things about undercover work that's uh, interesting is uh, you're not you're not given really any direction by the FBI. You're just put undercover and told the goal. This is the goal. This is what we want. Go out and and and, and get it. And so then you try to figure out, well, who am I? Who do I need to target? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to get close to? Who knows so and so? Because, you know, if you just walk up to the main person and start just chatting them up, then well, they're going to think right off the bat, well, you're a cop. So sometimes you have to kind of go around to the peripheral people and work your way into the group that way. And so working with an activist group, investigating an, F at an activist group, you're not necessarily in danger of being murdered if you're revealed, just that the case is gone. Right. A lot of times. It, it, it depends. You know, like in the United States, probably not murdered. When we were overseas in these other countries, uh, they do things a little differently in those other countries. <laughs> you know, something could have gone wrong over there and uh, they may have been looking for a body over there in some of those countries. In the United States, you know, most of the time, no, but it, they could do significant property damage, you blow up your car, burn down your uh, house, things like that. You're not above that for sure. But um, yeah, but outright murder, probably not. Okay, interesting. And then the second book picks up from there. Mm hmm. And what happens to Lexi? <laughs> well, Lexi, is a, Lexi is kind of coming off of her first mission and she's still kind of not sure is this undercover stuff for me. She gets called to South Carolina thinking that there's a, a an earth liberation front, um, an attack down in South Carolina, which anybody that knows of South Carolina, that's probably not going to be the case because we just really don't have the um, ELF people in the South, but it looks, that's what it looks like. There's the whole calling card. So at this point, Lexi is the expert and act, uh, the activist, the ex, the extremist, I should say. And that's actually really funny because that happened to me. I worked this one long-term case with the extremist. And then I get a phone call to come back and work another case. And I said, well, what do you want me? And they said, well, you're the expert. I said, I've worked one case. And that's, they're like, well, that's one more case than anybody else has worked. So you're the expert on extremism <laughs> for this, this kind of extremist. So it was kind of funny. So that's what happens to Alexei. She gets called to go down to South Carolina. But in this case, things are a little different. She's out there kind of hanging by a thread. And um, she doesn't have a real good contact agent. That a contact agent is the only tether that an undercover has to reality. That's the person that they can meet. That's the person that they pass documents through. That's the person that kind of makes sure that they're okay. They're mentally okay. Because when you're working full-time undercover, you're not bouncing into the FBI office. You can't go into the FBI office. You can't uh, be seen with other FBI agents. You're living a whole different life. So your contact agent is the person that you do have some control or some contact with. Well, in the second book, I thought, how fun would it be if Lexi's contact agent was just terrible? I mean, if he was too busy, if he didn't have time for her, if he didn't, you know, if he didn't help her. And I will say that is the fiction part of that, because the whole time I worked undercover, I had outstanding contact agents. And then there were a few times where I thought, what would I have done if I hadn't had Ralph or if I didn't have Vicky? Uh, you know, or if I didn't have Bruce, because I had such fantastic contact agents. That's what kind of started in my head. What if that hadn't happened? What would have, what would I have been like? How would I handle this? So I thought, well, let's see how Lexi deals with it. So she's thrust into this world and it turns out to be a very dangerous drug investigation. And she ends up um, really over her head and taken hostage and a whole, whole lot of things happen. 
I will say in the second book, there's a character in it, uh, Captain Mead, and he is a real person. When I was young, when I was a teenager and young adult, I worked on a tour boat in South Carolina for this crazy captain. He he was so wonderful, and I just looked up to him, and he taught me all about the Low Country and the whole history, mystery, romance of the Low Country. So I wanted to put a character just like my real life. He was Captain Sandy. So I talked to the captain and I said, I think I'm going to put you in the book. I, you, you'll be you know, like Captain Mead, but I, you have to be in the book, you know? And so he thought it was funny. And I wrote this character and built this relationship between Lexi and this captain. And it was kind of a little bit cat and mouse at first, but it became a real true loving relationship that they, you know, he, he mentored her and she looked up to him. And that was what I had with my, my real captain friend and the books dedicated to him. Unfortunately, he passed away before the book came out. So it was, it was kind of um, sad, but he did, he did get to read uh, the dedication. So he knew the book was dedicated to him. So uh, everybody says, well, which one's your favorite? And that's a hard one because um, I, I, the, the second book was so easy for me to write and that character of Captain Mead, I, I love so much that it's hard for me not to say that's not my favorite. And I know you shouldn't pick a favorite because it's like picking a favorite child, but but I just enjoyed writing Beyond the Cabin so much. It was just, um, it was such a pleasure to write. And, and I wrote it in record time. <laughs> and the third one. So the third one is, it picks up with Lexi in really bad shape. At the, by the end of Beyond the Cabin, she's a mess. Uh, it doesn't turn out well. She's um, physically and mentally uh, in bad shape. And she shouldn't be working undercover. And she knows she shouldn't be working undercover. She's trying to walk away from the undercover life. But anytime somebody calls and says, hey, we need you, and it happens to be in a, a case overseas, there's a missing constable, uh, and they need uh, the help from the FBI. So Lexi starts to think, you know, well, what if I'm the only person that can do this? You know, we have a life hanging in the balance. And so against the wishes of everybody, including the therapist she was seeing, Lexi takes off and, and accepts this uh, undercover mission. And I will say, you know, politics do play in a lot of times, um, you know, everybody knows Lexi shouldn't go on this mission. But if it makes the FBI look good, then Lexi will go on this undercover mission. So all of that was pretty true to life when it came to that. So that's how uh, she ends up in the third book. But she's she starts things out really rough. She's in bad shape. She's um, <laughs> and it doesn't get much better as the book goes along. <laughs> but she is paired up with a male partner in that one. Part of it is because she's so fragile. They feel like they need she needs somebody there with her. But the other part is kind of you know um, who's watching who and that. Uh, that scenario. Okay. And your fourth book. My fourth book is actually not a Lexi Montgomery book. It's uh, it's in the final stages of editing. Now I'm uh, working on all the last of the revisions, but I've switched genres and that was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be to go from a, like a crime writer, thriller writer. This is more literary fiction. And I've gone from plot driven to character driven. And I really didn't realize how hard that was going to be. <laughs> so the, the the book has nothing to do with the FBI, which is great because it doesn't have to go through pre-publishing review. But it's basically, I say it's the big chill meets wild. It takes place on the Appalachian Trail. And it's a group of friends that grew up together that are now in their 50s that um, have been separated by miles and years, but have come back together because of a tragedy. And they go out on the Appalachian Trail to kind of support one of the members of the team and, uh, they all find out along the way that they're all carrying baggage and uh, they need to shed some of this baggage and they they get to know each other because there's nothing I need, there's nothing like a childhood friend. I mean those people that knew you when you were 12, 13 years old they're just different than the friends that you meet as an adult. Well, so sorry. now they're in their 50s and and it's funny, it was fun to write but uh, I am still in the revision stage because I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper in the characters but um, it was fun to write, but it's also pretty serious too. So it has it has some comedy to it too, but it also has a lot of uh, serious life struggles. Okay, wonderful. So, why <laughs> so we'll have you back to talk about your fourth book. But in the meantime, how can our watchers find your books 
your crime books, books, your crime fiction books? Where can they purchase them and find out more as well? Oh, okay. Well, if they want to find out uh, more about me and they want to talk to me, uh, my website is uh, DanaRidenour.net. So it's uh, DanaRidenour.net. And um, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions. So all of that's on there. My contact information is on there. The books are available through any bookstore, independent bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any of the bookstores. If they don't carry them, they can order them, but you can get them off of Amazon too in the in um, paperback, um, ebook, and audiobook. So if you're an audiobook person, the books are read by Kate Marson, all three of them, and she's my narrator, and she does a fabulous job of narrating. I mean, I love listening to them because she she does such a better job than I could ever do. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Dana. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and definitely come back when you finish your fourth novel. I would love to. Thank you very much. I think that would be a perfect book for The Midnight Sleep. <laughs> Ex that's what I was thinking. It sort of made me think of, was it The Traveling Pants? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.